With just days to go until the Iowa caucuses, presidential politics are taking center stage. Let's discuss that and more with Brooks and Capehart. That's New York Times columnist David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart, associate editor for The Washington Post. It's good to see you both. Let's talk a bit about Iowa, shall we? Uh, David, the latest poll of Iowa voters found that among Republicans, former President Donald Trump has a dominant lead. That hasn't changed. But this is the first poll to find that Nikki Haley is now opening a real lead over Ron DeSantis. She has 20 percent to his 13 percent, and her lead is outside of the poll's margin of error. How do you interpret these numbers? Disastrous for Ron DeSantis. I mean, he's really bet a lot on Iowa. He's said to have an amazing ground game. He's invested zillions of dollars in Iowa. And if he's down to 13 percent, I don't see how the campaign really goes forward. He said he'll go to South Carolina, maybe skip New Hampshire. But I, I just don't see uh, how, how he recovers from us showing that bad when he's invested this much time and effort. As for, um, as for Nikki Haley, very good number for her. She's kind of late in the game, less organized on the ground. Uh, on the other hand, there is a ceiling on her. And that's because if you look at who's voting for her, it's college-educated Republicans. And this is a working class party, and she has ver done very poorly trying to crack into that working class group. She's done very poorly trying to crack into that uh, evangelical group. And so Trump has great organization, great presence. People are waiting to wait around. I have read recently five and six hours as he shows up late. They'll stick around. They want to see Donald Trump. So all indications are that Donald Trump is sitting pretty. And if those polls are right, then Ron DeSantis is in trouble. And Jonathan, you could argue there are two ways to look at this, that one, Nikki Haley is even better positioned to do well in New Hampshire, especially if she has a strong showing in Iowa, or that the race for number two is meaningless when the front runner is 30 plus points ahead. How do you see it? Exactly. <laughs> I keep wondering, why are these people in the race, one, because the front runner is 34 points ahead in that, in that poll, in the Suffolk University poll you just showed, but also he's ahead in all of the polls and they haven't taken they they have not taken the gloves off against him except for I, I think Nikki Haley took the gloves off uh, this week and Ron DeSantis in some way took the gloves off but they should have been doing that from the moment they got into the campaign and so again as i've said uh, on friday nights now for at, at least a month maybe two when when it comes to the Iowa caucuses I will be curious to see if that 34-point spread in the Suffolk University poll shows up in actual votes. And if Donald Trump doesn't wipe the floor with Haley or DeSantis, whoever comes in number two, then we have to start to wonder, can he make it through, can he make it through New Hampshire? And does that provide an opportunity for Nikki Haley to maybe win New Hampshire, but then get uh, obliterated in her home state of South Carolina? Well, how can Nikki Haley capitalize on Chris Christie's exit from the race? Because the one thing his campaign proved is that there is no nationwide constituency for a Republican who's willing to break with Donald Trump in the way that he did. Right. Yeah, now there's a, a let me go to my traditional role as the irrational optimist. And there is a scenario uh, for Haley. Um, she does well in Iowa, or better than expected, maybe comes within 25 points of Donald Trump. She goes to New Hampshire, Christie's gone, DeSantis is sort of out of it, even if he's not officially out of it. And then she's, she's really, with Christie out, she's in the realm of tying Trump, she's sort of in the ballpark. That would be big news. He's basically a sitting incumbent president. And if a sitting incumbent president loses New Hampshire, then that's big news. I agree with John, uh, she'll then go on to lose her home state. But then after that, we have Michigan, which is an open primary, and independents can, can vote in it. And so that looks a little better for her. And then after that, we have a whole run of states. So there's some plausible scenario. Uh, the way things are breaking, it, it turns out to Haley Trump uh, in short order, and then she has some remote chance. Jonathan, what do you think? Does Chris Christie's exit change the dynamics of this race in any meaningful way? No, no. And un uh, unfortunately, that's the case. I mean, you know, I don't agree with Governor Christie on a whole lot of things, but I thought his role as a candidate for the Republican nomination was an important one because he was fearless in taking the argument uh, to the party against Donald Trump. And the fact that a person who is telling the truth about a four times indicted 
on 91 counts, former president, shouldn't be the standard bearer of their party. The party rejected him by not by not supporting him, meaning meaning Chris Christie. And so it's it's unfortunate that he had to get out of the race, but it's also unfortunate that there's no constituency for the truth telling that he has. Let's talk about the Biden campaign, because The Washington Post reported this past weekend that former President Barack Obama has raised questions about the structure of President Biden's reelection campaign and has even discussed this with President Biden himself. Of course, David Axelrod, the former Obama strategist, he's been very public about his own criticisms about the campaign. And to be clear, they're not criticizing President Biden. They're criticizing um, the effectiveness and the messaging of the campaign. In your view, is there reason for worry? Yeah, I mean, there are now, well, first, there's reason for worry, because if the election were held today, in my view, Donald Trump would be elected president. So that's reason for Democrats to worry. And in my conversation with Democrats around the country, I've noticed there are now 85 million political consultants. Uh, <laughs> every Democrat I know has got some words of advice on how Biden can do a lot better. And I happen to agree with the Obama people. And by the way, the Biden people will hate it when the Obama people judge them. Um, uh, and I do think Axelrod and Obama are essentially correct that, of course, he had to do a January 6th speech. Of course, going to Mother Emanuel Church was important. But he does have to show how I'm going to make your life better. And the core reason Donald Trump is doing OK is a lot of Americans think their life was better under him than under Biden. And so there, in my view, he has to look at the Reagan campaign in 1980, an old guy who said, no, here's how, what I'm going to do for you. And he has to have law and order. Donald Trump is an agent of chaos, a, a lawbreaker. For a Democrat to be a law and order, a persuasive law and order candidate at a time of global chaos, that would be a good thing. And then I think he really has to somehow get into the working class. You can't give away that many votes, especially among the Hispanic working class. So I think he has to champion business, small business, uh, and show he's, he's for enterprise and aspiration. And these are not the usual democratic themes, but I think he really needs to do it to sort of claw back some of that working class. Jonathan, I know you're uh, deeply sourced in both Biden world and Obama world. Uh, what do you make of this, this, this Democrat, the sense among some Democrats that the campaign isn't as nimble or as effective as it needs to be to meet the moment? It is, I mean, this, I file this under the, it's like a file folder within the Democratic bedwetting folder uh, <laughs> that I keep. But I do, but, I, but that being said, I do think that Democrats should be running scared. I do think that it is important that former President uh, Obama is talking to the current president and saying, hey, you need to take this seriously. But I, I am also confident that President Biden and the Biden campaign absolutely are taking the threat of Donald Trump seriously the, the, and, and taking seriously that their message isn't getting through. I mean, I take David, um, you know, everything he just said is right and true. But as he was talking about the things that the president should be doing or the campaign should be doing, I was thinking back to last fall when the president was doing and the campaign and the administration was doing exactly that. I think that we have to we have to not look at this campaign as um, from the snapshot of of one week and oh my God, because they didn't talk about this or they didn't have a message on that this particular week, that they're not going to be talking about it or have been talking about it. Uh, so I, I am not worried, but I, I do think that uh, Democrats need to give the administration, give the president, give the campaign the room to let its campaign unfold and, and rest assured that they, they take the threat of Donald Trump but also the Republican Party, seriously, because to think about this. If Donald Trump, through some miracle, is not the Republican nominee, Trumpism is still abroad in the land. MAGA is still abroad in the land. And so whether Trump's the nominee or not, there still will be an alternative for Biden to run against. You know, that raises the question in the minute and a half we have left. I was going to move to another topic, but I'll stay on this one. What is the future of the Republican Party? I mean, Donald Trump will cede the ground at some point as the, as the sort of titular head of the Republican Party. What is left? Uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a different party. Uh, it's going to be a working class party. And, you know, we, we too often look at America only. Uh, every country has a, a right wing uh, populist party. Uh, and so it's going to be a party that's going to be suspicious of foreign adventures, unlike the earlier Republican Party. It's going to be a party suspicious of international trade. Uh, it's going to be uh, a party that represents the, um, 
the hope for the Republicans is we're going to be a multiracial working class party. And they're not far away. The Hispanic movement to the Republicans has, among the working class voters has been very significant. Even some of the black working class has moved a little, not that much. But um, a multiracial working class party is what they are hoping for. And it's not impossible. David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart, good to see you both. Have a good weekend. Thanks.